action. Our members are all at the forefront of providing access to safe and affordable health services globally. We were founded in 2005, and Pocky focuses on a variety of projects and communities of practice with an emphasis on performance and information management. We work with our members and partners to develop support system solutions that can track the performance of large numbers of projects in a variety of countries against strategic goals to align financial investment with results and allow NGOs to collect, analyze, and share information across programmatic, departmental, institutional, and geographical boundaries. The story of how we came together is very interesting. It was not as spontaneous as we would have hoped. In reality, several health organizations were forced to the conference table by a funder that we all had in common. In this case, it was the David and Lucille Packard Foundation. The foundation was very frustrated by the realization that much of its grant money was being spent to solve the same logistical problems around the management of health information and data. They were certain that a common solution existed that could benefit all of its grantees, and they asked us, the grantees, to talk among ourselves to learn in what ways we could successfully collaborate around issues dealing with the management of information. During these discussions, an interesting thing occurred. We call it our aha moment, and it is all centered on a project called MKENI. MKENI was a USAID Kenya funded project aimed at improving the health of Kenyans through integrated family planning, reproductive health, and child survival services, including HIV AIDS, and it was focused on the coast and western provinces of Kenya. And Kenny was implemented by four of our members, Engender Health, PATH, Family Health International, and IntraHealth. As part of the M. Kenny project, each member had to create regular reports to the various stakeholders, and there were lots of stakeholders, including several of the Kenya ministry, the U.S. government, some private foundations, and the other participating partner organizations. Much of this reporting was done quarterly with a more detailed report yearly. As Engender Health and PATH and Family Health International and IntraHealth sat at the packet sponsored collaboration table and compared notes, this is what we realized. We realized that we were reporting to multiple stakeholders using basically the same information. Each of these stakeholders required us to report using slightly different formats. Many of them were, uh, forced us to report against different time frames. For instance, the yearly report for USAID, the US government, was due in September. The yearly report for Agenda Health was due in July. The yearly report for the World Health Organization was due in January 1st. And so, uh, the time frames forced us to do basically the same report but at different times. The indicators of success that we used to do reporting were slightly different. One report might ask how many men, women, and children were serviced by the Ancani project. Another might ask how many men or how many women, but not children. And so what we were forced to do was use cut it and paste to change the reports in order to meet the requirements of the stakeholders. In the meantime, we had very little time left to do data analysis to improve the quality of our project work, and we lacked the basic tools for project and information management that most organizations have. It was really a profound moment for us and forced us to continue the conversation. We realized that the private sector had not really provided us with the quality performance management tool that effectively aligned with the needs and budgets of small, medium, and large nonprofit organizations. Many groups use basic tools, such as spreadsheets or simple databases, and spend many hours tracking their work and assembling information needed for project management, 
evaluation, reporting, and decision making. The scale of their local, regional, and global operations exceeded their capacity to collect information in a timely and consolidated way. So when the key staff from these health, health organizations were brought together to discuss these common needs around better performance management, the information exchange was profound. It was like the opening of a floodgate. In some cases, the knowledge sharing had more value than the actual specific tool or solution that we were discussing. While organizations may not all use the same problem-solving widget, they do share the same history of identifying the point of pain and developing a resolution. So when Pocky chose to build upon the many activities around the sharing of best practices and lessons learned in a spirit of collegial collaboration. We can look at performance management needs and solutions for the individual, for the project team, and for the organization. Lately, a lot of our work has focused on project management tools and solutions. Working with our partners, Inside NGO and Lingo, we have promoted project management training developed specific, specifically for the NGO community and with a globally accepted certification. We also provide our members with information and training on support tools like Smartsheet, which is an online project management, productivity, and team collaboration application. For today's webinar, we're going to look at some examples of information management systems. These solutions are part of projects that were initiated by a single or group of NPOCI members and partners. We work with these organizations to come up with viable, affordable solutions, especially those designed to work in low resource environments. And I'm sure the AHEAD membership are very familiar with the challenges of working in low resource environments. We share the results of these projects with the larger health community, emphasizing not just the specific solution, but the deliverables, the process, and the best practices and lessons learned. So some examples of these information management systems include an enterprise resource planning system, a clinic management system, or patient health records management system, a human resources information system, a monitoring and evaluation data aggregation system, an enterprise information resource management system, and then internal and external knowledge management system. So this, these are just some of the examples of the kinds of information management systems that we commonly work with. So our first example is a member project that we work, we're currently working on with one of our members, Helen Keller International. We're working with them to choose and uh, uh, implement what's called an enterprise resource planning system. An ERP is an organization management system used to automate and facilitate the flow of data between critical back office functions with a focus on financial management. The elements of an ERP may include core accounting, like a general ledger, or accounts payable and accounts receivable, cash management, budgeting, and also dealing with currency and currency conversion. Uh, those of you who work across countries know the challenge of working with multiple currencies and converting those currencies especially if your funder is providing uh, funds in a, even a third currency. We also uh, look at awards management, including proposal management, grants management. For many of you, use, for many of you, you uh, receive money and then you give out grants to smaller organizations. We call that sub-awards management. And some of you contract with consultants, and we consider that contracts management, and there are modules to deal with that as well. There are also uh, modules like timekeeping, dealing with the time of your staff and your consultants, uh, payroll, being able to pay your staff, procurement, the buying of goods and services, fixed staff, that's the management of all those assets that you buy, human resources, the management of your staff, reporting on all of these, uh, these uh, uh, modules, and looking at business intelligence. That is the ability to use this information to make data-driven decisions about how to improve the project and how to improve the management of your organization. We work with several organizations to implement ERP solutions. 
And while most have included one vendor providing most of the required modules, we have seen a movement toward utilizing what's called the best of breed, choosing separate systems that solve individual needs. For instance, an HR management system or a grants and contracts management system, and then integrating these applications using a data warehouse and common APIs to create an interface that gives the end user access to all of these specific applications. And we've done several webinars and we've recorded them that provide case studies for both approaches, both for the enterprise approach and the best of breed approach. So feel free to visit the MPOCI website if you're interested in learning more about uh, these kinds of solutions. Let me just take a break to uh, mention that if you have questions, feel free to post them um, either through the, uh, the uh, uh, WebEx uh, interface, through the chat, or through the questions box, and I'll be glad to answer them. Uh, we will have uh, questions and answers at the end of the presentation, but if there's a timely message right now, I'd be happy to interrupt and uh, answer your questions. Another example of a member project is a clinic management system. Now, I know that a lot of AM members are very familiar with both uh, uh, patient record keeping and clinic management systems. Um, and we have great interest in these products as well. Uh, we work with one of our member organizations um, to come up with a clinic management system. That uh, member was the International Planned Parenthood Federation. Uh, they're very interested in open source solutions and so are we. We have a great interest in open source solutions and promote the use of open source uh, solutions among our members. Uh, they looked at tools like OpenMRS and OpenEMR and also DHIS2. And I'm sure the members are familiar with all of these systems, all very popular open source systems. And I believe that many of the AHAN members have had training in the use of DHIS2 as a tool for data aggregation and for, for management of health information, including patient record keeping, charting, patient clinician interaction, the processing of fees if there are fees involved, inventory management, staff management, clinic management, and the collection and reporting of service statistics. Now, International Planned Parenthood Federation is a unique organization in that it manages its own private clinics. So these are not public health clinics, these are private clinics that IPPF manages itself, and therefore its need for clinic management systems were very specific around the kinds of services it offered its clientele. Another example of an HR, of a member project that we work with is the HR information system. In this case, I'm gonna highlight um, work done by a member organization, InfraHealth International, and their IRIS product. Dickie Settle, who is one of our MPOCI board members, and I believe Dickie has done presentations for AHAN as well, and so uh, you may be familiar with this product, but IRIS supplies health sector leaders with information to track, manage, and plan the health workforce. It includes several modules, including IRIS management for health service delivery, IRIS qualify for health professional counsel, IRIS plan, for workforce planning and modeling, IRIS retained for planned and cost retention interventions, and IRIS trained for tracking pre-service and in-service training. It's a very interesting product, very well uh, documented, used by many countries, uh, especially in Africa. We see a lot of use of the IRIS system in Africa. And uh, Vicky and his team have been working tirelessly to improve and add uh, functionality. Uh, we really like the approach and the work done by uh, Atria Health International and especially around the IRIS uh, product. Another example, and this is an example of one member building an application and then uh, uh, allowing us to share the application or the solution with other members and with the community at large. This organization was the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, also known as IAVI. Uh, at the time, IAVI had a specific need for a monitoring and evaluation 
data aggregation system. They decided to build their own. Now, Enpaki as an organization does not uh, uh, promote custom applications. We feel that although they may be successful at the beginning, the amount of time and effort to update them, to keep them active, uh, to add new features does not justify the cost. Also, most of our organizations are not in the business of developing software. They're in the business of, of working in health, uh, uh, working with patients and with clients to solve health needs. There are plenty of organizations out there whose main function is to develop software applications, and we feel that we should pass that job off to them and work with them in order to design applications that work for our community. So the merit product included multi-level indicators. It dealt with both qualitative and quantitative data. It was easily integrated. It was built upon SharePoint and was easily integrated with some of the other applications they were using. It allowed them to use multiple frameworks and multiple timelines. They had a mobile phone version and the actual application was web-based. And most importantly, it allowed for offline access so that some of the field offices and some of their partners could work on the merit application without being online. And then when they were online, they could uh, then synchronize the data. Based on the first version of merit, Mpaki uh, came in and began working on a merit two and a merit three. We took their custom application and, and we tried to make it more generic. To, to make it uh, more open source and available to other organizations. And based on those solutions, some of our other members picked up the requirements document and some of the uh, uh, use cases and then created uh, applications for themselves, which we then shared back with the community. It's a model that we like a lot. And uh, uh, the good news is that since the merit application has been in use, a lot more from the private sector has come in, into existence. And so there are more off-the-shelf applications that deal with the uh, collection and aggregation of m and &E data. And the one system that everyone was looking for, of course, was the, the uh, enterprise management system. That is the system that, that took all of those smaller systems, the m and &E system, the financial management system, the project management system, the, uh, the uh, procurement system, the, uh, the policies and procedure system and brought them under one uh, interface for users to access. An example of this, an existing model, was the IMIS system used by International Planned Parenthood Federation. Uh, it's been around for a while, over 10 years. It's a web-based system used to track over 4,000 live projects in over 120 countries. It's an interactive, multilingual system used by those running projects in the field, as well as the regional and headquarters staff. It contains modules for project design, and it tracks the use of people, money, and other resources, and it integrates with International Planned Parenthood financial system and allows for both qualitative and data reporting on both project and aggregate levels. Now, this system is a custom system, and again, we don't recommend custom systems for our members, but when members are interested in building this kind of overall enterprise management system, we can point them to ICPF and a few other organizations that have attempt, uh, attempted to do exactly this. Often we'll deal with what's called the proof of concept, where we'll work with one organization to solve a problem and use this as a model for other organizations to solve a similar problem. A good example of this is something that I'm sure that the AHEN members are familiar with. We call it website sustainability. Here's the scenario. You receive grant money to work on a project or program, and as part of that project or program, you create a website, and that website has very specific information that is specific to the topic or resource that you're promoting in the work that you're doing. The website becomes filled with information and is very successful and helps to promote the work of the project. But finally, the project comes to an end. What happens to the website? The website may still have value. It may still need to be carried on into the future 
without the project money to sustain that website, what do you do? One of our members, Management Sciences for Health, came to us, to us with that exact problem. And we looked at sustainability options for this topic resource specific website. We worked with them on the site, which was about uh, OBC support, orphans and vulnerable children, a very specific sector of health clients. And the obcsupport.net website was very successful while their project was receiving funding. But the project funding came to an end and they wanted to know what to do. We helped them to develop an understanding of the perceived value of this website. We, hate this, we helped them to evaluate the most likely formats for sustainability once that project uh, funding ended. We did do an environmental scan of a similar existing resources to see whether their resource was really that unique or perhaps the information was already available at other sites that would not justify their continuing the website. Uh, and we helped to recommend a plan uh, uh, forward in a way to keep the site uh, going even after the funding dollars had ended. Uh, this model for website sustainability without, we now share with other organizations facing the same challenge. My project is coming to an end. What do I do with my website? Is it worth continuing? And if it is, how do we do it? So we've talked about information management and information sharing. Um, the bigger picture, of course, is something called knowledge management. Now, uh, a knowledge management and information management are maybe interchangeable, but knowledge is the value of information as it applies to real use cases. And we provide organizations with a lot of tools and knowledge around good uh, collaboration tools, uh, abilities to share resources and ideas, ways to partner with other nonprofit organizations around the sharing of knowledge and information. We provide tools for auditing the, the flow of information within organizations and various solutions. So whether we're promoting things like SharePoint uh, or Smartsheet or document management using tools like Box.org or collaborations using tools like WebEx, which we're hosting today's uh, webinar or GoToMeeting or the um, Microsoft Solution Link, or whether we're, we're promoting partner organizations like Lingos or the Global Health Knowledge Collaborative or Inside NGO. We feel that putting all of these, these, uh, this information and these organizations out to our members gives them a, a list of resources in order to use uh, to help them better manage their information and their knowledge needs. We feel that Empaki really adds value to the, both the individuals, the projects, and the organizations working with us. Uh, we're member driven. We have a proven history of performance management systems, a lot of field experience among our members, and I'm sure among the AHAM members as well, with a specific focus on monitoring and evaluation data. Uh, we share best practices and lessons learned. We have great communities of practice uh, where we share information among our members and partners. Lots of tools and resources. We focus on project management and cost-effective training and support. These tools and solutions provide value to both the individual, the project, and to the entire organization. In the future, we hope to work more with AHAM, and we have many, many ways we feel we can do this. Uh, and Pocky does lots and lots of webinars. We have a whole series that's running right now called Connecting the Information Dots, and it's a series of webinars showing how we take information management systems and connect them together. We've been running this series for about two years. We do monthly webinars. We have quite a turnout uh, of hundreds of people attending these webinars, and we record them, and we make them freely available to the community. Some of the topics have include, uh, included things like global accounting, uh, SharePoint leveraging your investment, monitoring and evaluation using DHIS2. We looked at some new products like Dev Results, I mentioned Smartsheet before. We look at things like the Rockefeller Foundation's e-health strategy, a very interesting presentation, and support frontline for health workers using mobile applications, something I know that is of great interest to the AHEM members. We also hold trainings and in-person meetings uh, 
Most of these, of course, are in the U.S., but we do do some in the field as well. A lot of our, our trainings are in the Africa region where many of our members have a, a lot of field offices. We do trainings on something called iWriter, which is our approach to peer training. Uh, I could spend a whole presentation just talking about the iWriter approach, but think of it as a way of providing training on the use of these tools and solutions that's cost effective and that is field based. That is, it's not flying people from headquarters out to the field to train people, but using people in country who have existing knowledge about solutions to train their peers and how to use those solutions. We've done uh, uh, trainings around things like NGO project management, uh, about opening and closing offices, which can be a very daunting task. Um, we brought together various summits around monitoring and evaluation, around training management, about developing a, a, a disaster recovery and business continuity plan. And we also provide technical assistance and consulting to members and groups of members, including the ERP design and implementation that I talked about earlier, uh, how to implement a knowledge management uh, project or program within your organization, uh, how to do strategic IT planning, planning for your IT needs within your organization to meet the various requirements of the projects that need those IT, IT tools and solutions, how to do an information audit or doing an information audit for organizations to see how information flows within your organization, doing development of portals, websites um, that provide resources and information to the uh, health community, how to do better project management, how to do systems assessment, and of course, system design and usability. These are just some of the ways we, we uh, uh, think that we could work with AHEN and AHEN members in the future, and we look forward to the conversation that we can have around the best practices and lessons learned about co collaborating with other health organizations. So this has been just a brief overview of some of the uh, uh, projects that uh, MPACI is working on around information management systems and about the, the kinds of uh, trainings, consulting, solutions, and activities that we do. I'm sure that you must have questions, and so I think now would be a good time to pause and answer some of those questions. All right, thank you so much, Bill, for that uh, very short, very brief, and, uh, but very comprehensive introduction of NPOP. Actually, our uh, AD is really working on a uh, uh, transition to become an international NGO. But aside from that, I know there are a lot of e health professionals here who are struggling in the same problems that we have mentioned. I would like to invite everyone to post their questions in our Q and A box located at the lower right, uh, lower right panel of your screen. And to get the just to get the ball rolling, I have uh, this question from the OVC uh, support website that you mentioned. Um, after evaluating the website and after doing the scanning on the usability and relevance of the website, what well, then would be the, um, what would happen actually to the website that they have uh, just started? Uh, that's an excellent question. One of the things we did was we looked at the cost of actually running the ovcsupport.net website. And what we discovered was that almost all of the staff and resources put into, into that site were done by management scientists for health from their home office based in Washington, D.C. Now, you can imagine what the costs involved for staff who are U.S.-based to, to do that kind of resource. And although it was a global resource, and although most of the people using the site were based outside of the U.S., the cost of maintaining the site was very high. So we looked at what it would cost to maintain the same site if it was done in country. That is, if one of the uh, field offices or one of the partner organizations took over the management of the site. Well, we found out that it was substantially cheaper, uh, a third to maybe a quarter of what it would cost them originally. And so for far less money, they would be able to continue on. And to fundraise for that smaller amount of money was much more uh, uh, achievable than to fundraise for larger money to try to keep the website going. We also provided them with a list of partner organizations that had the skills and ability 
to specifically do that kind of website that understood the orphans and vulnerable children environment that had knowledge about that that those services um, and that also had staff who had the skills to maintain a web page and a portal and we provided them with that information so they knew who to talk to or the kind of organization to look for to partner with in order to keep the website going the result of that conversation was a they got a continuation on some funding and they are actively working now with a an organization based in South Africa to begin to continue on the conversation about keeping the OVC support.net website going. All right, that's a very good uh, story of what just happened uh, through their website because, as you may know, there are really a lot of things that are being missed out when um, when a, a project will be coming to an end. We have a question here from uh, Rajiv Joshi from India. Is it possible to, to do data collection using mobile or whether GIH-based data analysis is possible to be conducted, I think, by the or by MPO? Again, I am to repeat that. Is it possible to do data collection using mobile and whether GIS-based data analysis is possible to be assisted by NPO. So one of our members, uh, PSI, works heavily with DHIS2 and a mobile version to collect data that includes GIS information. So what we would do is if there's an organization that's looking to better implement or to look at some of the best practices and lessons learned from, inter uh, from implementing a mobile solution, using DHIS2 is we would bring those organizations together to talk. We would act as an intermediary, a project manager, so to speak, to help them come up with a solution and to do a proof of concept to test the various solutions that are available. If and when there's some success, we would then promote that information with other organizations. We would do a case study showing how they work together, and what happened, what worked, what didn't work, and then uh, look at ways of improving that process for the future. So hopefully there will be a successful implementation moving from one member to another, and then ultimately knowledge around implementing mobile solutions using DHIS2 that will help the developers of DHIS2 to improve the use of mobile tools and help the members using them to figure out how to better solve the requirements and needs. All right. Um, I think that would be uh, very good for our for our audience to know and for their organizations to know that uh, NPOC assists uh, organizations to prove their concept by uh, providing uh, measurable um, justice reasons and reasons for uh, for uh, intervention such as uh, what was uh, mentioned in the ASB data analysis. Okay, another question from Donald Baez from the Philippines. This is a good webinar. I really appreciate Bill for many insights that he's sharing. My question is, how are nonprofits using information technology to enhance mission-related outcomes and boost organizational performance? How have you managed it? But before you, uh, before you answer the question, um, I would like to uh, inform our listeners and our audience at the moment that if you want to clarify, you can just chat us and I will unmute you so that you could further clarify your question. So go ahead, Bill, and answer John Nard's question. So this is a very interesting topic for us because when organizations are working on health projects, there are indicators that they use to measure the success success of those projects. They're project-specific indicators, and uh, they usually require input of health data, numbers of patients tested, the, what the intervention was, how successful it was, cost of the intervention, that sort of thing. But organizations have their own indicators of success as an organization. They look at their own strategic plan. What do we want to accomplish in the next two to five years? What kinds of projects and work do we want to do what areas do we want to expand into? And they develop global indicators of success that go beyond just the project indicators. And so much of the data that's being collected goes against global indicators of success. 
the, the challenge has always been how do we take uh, project data, project indicators, and roll that up to help inform the global indicators. And we work with several organizations to do exactly that, to be able to map some of the project uh, data to help inform the global data to say, are we successful in the new initiatives that we wanted to do? We, we said we wanted to work with HIV AIDS. Are we being successful in working with HIV AIDS? We said we wanted to, to work in uh, solving tuberculosis. Are we being successful in that? How can we take the project data and move it to the global level or the regional level? We want to solve the problem of malaria, not just in one country, but in a group of countries. How can we aggregate the data to see how we're doing in a, a section of the world, not just in one country? So the ability to roll up data and aggregate it, not just for a, a region or a country, but across groups of countries, and also against the global indicators of success for an organization are exactly what we hope to accomplish. And we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We don't want to have to re-enter the data again in order to get this information. We want to have a path, a workflow that makes this process seamless. And several organizations are trying to do this. Some have had some modicum of success. Some, some have been, uh, had to start again. And we share those best practices and lessons learned with the, with the members. All right, uh, uh, Donald would like to say thank you to you. All right, I think this is very uh, useful because as you have mentioned, uh, it is really high time not to invent the wheel and not just to add to the exacerbation of the problem, but really address it in a way that is very strategic to your uh, to local goals and at the same time to regional or global goals or objectives. Here's a uh, response from Discupa in Thailand. I like the idea of sharing the best practice uh, so that an organization can learn from this successful case. Okay, Discupa, there's a question again from India. Do you use each of seven standards to transfer data on collected indicators? For individual projects? What we do is we often uh, try to convene uh, meetings where organizations share their indicators of success. Uh, we, we work with a lot of standard organizations, uh, I'm sure some that you, your members work with as well, to try to standardize the kinds of indicators that are used for data collection. And uh, often, especially when many different members are working on similar projects, we try to help them come up with similar indicators so that um, a funder, like the Packard Foundation, that funds several different health organizations, can use the same indicators across projects that are being managed by different organizations. So we attempt to do that. We don't create those indicators ourselves. We, we just... Um, uh, uh, try to work with, with partner or member organizations and allow them to do that. We bring those m and &E experts to the table and let them work with that, or we represent them at um, meetings of, of uh, groups like Health Information Network or, um, or the Global Health Knowledge Collaborative that address these kinds of issues. All right, so um, that's it. The task is uh, really on meeting people to the right uh, person or the right organization to solve their problem. From women of Thailand, if one NGO needs mobile application for data collection, can they use or ask technical assistance from NFOCI merit program? So uh, th this is in interesting. So for instance, with merit, because it was a custom solution, we don't like to promote the, the use of the specific merit tool that one organization has. What we do is provide members with the requirements document, the document that was used to create all the modules of merit, that, that was used to design the user interface, that was used to solve the problems of data transfer back and forth. And then we encourage the member to work with other organizations or other members to create a generic open source solution. And then we would share that open source solution with the membership. So if a, if a member really wants to build their own custom solution, we will connect them with other members who've done exactly that and let them continue that conversation uh, between themselves. 
uh, if and when they're finished, we will show that custom solution. A good example is one of our members is called iPass, and iPass built their own custom monitoring and evaluation solution um, because they had very specific uh, uh, monitoring and evaluation requirements and also because security was an issue for them and they wanted a system that was very, very secure. Um, IPASS then did a presentation for our membership on their monitoring and evaluation solution, which really was a knowledge management solution. And it was great interest to a lot of the members. We then allowed those members to connect with IPASS directly to begin to explore ways in which they could do something similar if they wanted a custom solution. But we as an organization would not be involved in that and we would not recommend a custom solution unless there was a compelling need for that kind of solution. Again, we want to turn to the software developers to do that, not to um, health organizations to start building software applications. All right. Uh, uh, to, uh, on that note, um, I would like to invite others to, I guess, uh, post the question before our time and thank you for your question. Um, I have uh, this question in my mind that I uh, pondering since um, five minutes ago. How do we maintain engagement of our partners in using a particular technology? For example, in um, in England, we are using um, HSX or Health Ingenuity Exchange. It's basically a collaboration platform wherein you could um, you could access high quality resources from our member country and from individuals themselves. But there is really a lot of struggle in engaging everyone in the network using that very powerful and very useful resource for their own setting. So how do you engage, or how the the policy, um, uh, basically, yes, engage, engage individuals or members of an organization to particularly work or use a particular technology that. So this is an excellent question. The reality is that there are lots of systems out there technology systems that can promote communities of practice and collaboration. We have several that we talked about in our webinars, but there are many out there. So the focus is not on the specific solution because there are so many, but rather on the best practices of creating, building, promoting, and supporting communities of practice. That's a, a skill and an art in itself. And we do a lot of work and we have a lot of uh, trainings and webinars on how to begin to engage a community in having a collaborative conversation, how to bring people to the virtual table using these kinds of tools, how to encourage discussion of various topics, how to moderate them, how to allow for freedom of conversation without too much uh, uh, control, but also how to make sure that the, the conversation stays focused and how to keep the conversation going and encourage even more conversation. So all of those are skills that can be trained. One of the ways we do that is with our iWriter training. I, if you remember, I mentioned that an iWriter is a peer trainer. And we have a lot of people who are very good at creating and managing communities of practice. And we use them to engage and train other people to manage communities, whether they're using social media, like, like a, um, a Facebook kind of environment, or just an email listserv or using some of the many tools out there that uh, allow for these kinds of communities to thrive, either in real time or um, in, in a, a forwarding of, uh, of information like email listserv. And so that's the focus of our, of our solution, not on the specific tool, although as I say, we do do webinars in which we showcase some of the various tools that are being used. Thank you. That's very, um, very uh, interesting for me and for the network, I know, because we we all have our own intentions of improving e-health in our region, improving health through technology in our region. But most of us are really, really do not have the answers at hand. So by, by being part of community of practice and by being uh, able to work with and talk to me, I know, you know, uh, I know this could be a reality. 
Can I add, can I add one more thing? Um, no, it's, interesting, it's interesting that although we're talking about technology and technology tools, that really is secondary to trying to solve various problems. And often the problems are solved not with the tool, but with an evaluation of the process being used. So the tools are secondary. The, the, the really important thing is to identify what the problem is, what are the various solutions, and what needs to be done to ensure success of those solutions. Just throwing the tool at a problem doesn't uh, solve the problem. And as many of your members know, uh, if you put the wrong tool or solution out there, it doesn't solve the problem and makes it even more complicated. So tools are secondary to the solution, uh, the best practices of the, and the use of a process in order to solve the problem. All right. Uh, thank you on that. Uh, really, uh, I, I oftentimes hear the, uh, those uh, really very good quotes and really uh, very engaging uh, information. But the problem is when it comes to application, it really uh, is hard to implement that. But I know with all the assistance that uh, we will be uh, having in our network, we can make this with the reality. From Jeremiah Soto, I think he, uh, he is from the Philippines. He said, Hi, Mr. Lester. I am Jeremiah Soto of a young NGO here in the Philippines, providing electronic health records to public clinics in our country. I would like to ask if NPOFI could evaluate our system or platform and its features too thoroughly, and how could this be possible? So we could do two things. Sure, we could evaluate the system. But I think a better way would be to train that organization on how to evaluate its own system. There are process for, processes for evaluating systems that are very easy to do and provide good results for the organization. So by teaching that organization to begin to understand how to evaluate its own system, it can then come up with requirements for changes and improvements or use of training or whatever to make sure that there's success in the use of that those uh, patient records uh, tools that they've created. So we can work in both ways. Um, in our case, uh, I probably would recommend a partnering with one of our uh, member organizations that work in Asia. Uh, we work with the Asia Foundation heavily, and they have a lot of, of good practices and tools in this area. And I might suggest that that kind of partnership might be a, a, a good solution. But I would have to talk to that individual directly and then perhaps come up with a, uh, an approach that might be um, uh, appropriate for the size of the organization and for what they actually want to do as far as evaluating the tools. All right. Uh, thank you so much. It would be uh, very good for them because you do not just teach a man how, uh, the answers, but you really teach him how to be able to maintain it by, by, by himself. And that's really the heart of empowerment, I believe. So I think we're, that would be our last question. We are four minutes to go before 11 a.m. And we know that this is just one hour. All right. So, um, uh, Bill, any, la any last words or message to all of us who are uh, in this uh, webinar? Go ahead. So thank you all for allowing me to share some information about MPOCI, about our members and project and the work that we do. And uh, I put up one more slide. Feel free to reach out to any of our staff and members to learn more information. One of the things we do is we love just sharing information, whether it's through email or through a Skype phone call or through a quick presentation. And to connect uh, like organizations doing similar work to learn solutions. And I'm sure that there are many of your member organizations working in Asia who can learn from some of our members who work in Africa or Latin America doing similar work, trying to solve similar problems to avoid that syndrome of reinventing the wheel. So thank you all for uh, listening and taking the time to participate. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to talking to either individuals or to organizations in the future, uh, ho hopefully around possibilities of collaboration. All right, thank you so much to Bill and to Mpofi, to our attendees in our Indian Hour team on July 9 for our next 
Asian hour. Um, Bill, could I send your slides? Could you send us your slides and so that I could share it also to our I members? Absolutely. I will send you a copy of the slides and please feel free to share them with the membership. All right. Thank you so much. Um, and see you at our next Asian hour. Thank you, Bill. Goodbye.